introduction. Okay, great. Great. Well, hi, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us today. My name is Susan Max Emmon, and I am the director of the International Arts and Mind Lab at uh, Johns Hopkins Brain Science Institute. Um, so over the last several years, we have heard from a wide range of people who have spoken about different aspects of social justice, from incarceration, policing, community development, civic engagement, governance, and advocacy. Today, we are going to hear from another critical societal sector, our cultural institutions. At their best, these are institutions who remind us of our humanity, asking us to look at our past, our present, and our future through the lens of music, visual arts, dance, digital arts, and so much more. We're fortunate to have great cultural institutions in Baltimore, both large and small, that are engaged in their communities and committed to social justice. Today, it's my pleasure to introduce Chris Bedford, who is the Dorothy Wagner Wallace Director of the Baltimore Museum of Art. It is truly an understatement to say that Chris is shaping up what it means to be a cultural institution in the city, around the country, and around the world. He is radically changing our understanding of what a museum should be and provoking conversations and connections that are important and new on an individual and a collective level. Two things I'd like to mention before turning the screen over to Chris. First, we had hoped to include Erica Bridgeford from Baltimore Cease Fire in this discussion today. Cease Fire has been an essential partner in addressing systemic racism and violence and developing peaceful models and solutions in Baltimore. Unfortunately, due to some scheduling conflicts, Erica's not able to be with us today, but we're looking forward to having her join us in the future. Chris, however, will be sharing some of the work that the DMA and Ceasefire have collaborated on. Secondly, please send us your questions via chat or the Q&A box during Chris's talk. He will be addressing these in the, in the later part of, of, the, of the hour. With that, please join me in welcoming Chris Bedford. So thank you so much That's it for the elegant introduction and uh, for the audience this afternoon. Um, it's always a pleasure to talk about the work that we're doing at the BMA. Um, I always, I, I begin these conversations sometimes by saying that there are very, very few silver linings um, to the present moment, our present predicament, um, as defined by COVID-19. Um, but I will say that quarantine and uh, sort of sequester from my usual practice as my usual team has given me a tremendous amount of time to think and reflect on the true purpose of a cultural institution, what constitutes community, what kind of service we can provide, what is absent when we're closed, what we can do better when we reopen. And if you combine that with the very determined social justice basis of the work that we've been doing at the museum for the last um, three and a half years, going on four now, it does give me a very profound sense of purpose. Um, and it is particularly appealing for me to speak beyond my discipline. Um, I think the more art museums, cultural institutions, cultural anchors and civic contexts can reach into the mainstream or reach into disciplinary areas like this one beyond the usual purview of art, the more effective we can be in advancing um, socially actionable ideas. So I prefer to do a lot more of this speaking. It's greatly appealing to me. Um, I want to thank Courtney, who's going to advance all of my slides. This can sometimes be a tricky operation, but I have full faith in her. Um, so I'm going to maybe speak for 35 minutes or so, and then we can try and have a lively conversation. Um, so reflecting back on these uh, last four years of work um, has been a really, really interesting enterprise and is the basis of this presentation. So I'm um, just speaking from a very autobiographical perspective. I was drawn to the BMA quite specifically as a project. Um, I was the director of the University Art Museum, the Rose at Brandeis in Boston, and I was looking for a civic context to explore bigger ideas with a bigger, more diverse audience. And um, I had spent roughly a decade working with what I take to be a golden generation of black American artists who had turned art history on its head, um, not only formally, but in terms of material social address. And um, I wanted to find a context where I could make the work of this golden generation the leading creative edge of an institution. Um, additionally, I was very interested in a black majority city. 
and an institution with um, a long history and a willingness to shift its, shift its focus towards um, more direct and meaningful community engagement. So in, and I, I was able to check all those boxes and then some with the BMA, what they found was a board that wanted to reorient itself, didn't exactly know how to, um, but had great, great will to assume a new degree of relevance. So um, we went to work incredibly quickly um, in reordering the museum's priorities. And um, that culminated in June of 2018 in a rewriting of both our vision and our mission statements. And I'm showing you here excerpts from both. And if any of you on this um, Zoom are familiar with cultural institutions around this country and the way that they position and articulate their, their missions, you know that they are roughly interchangeable. So um, if you were looking at the mission statement for say LACMA in Los Angeles or the MFA in Houston or the MFA in Boston, they tend to recite the same, um, not trite, but say tired um, adages over and over again. And we wanted mission statements that captured our commitment to um, a particular set of principles grounded in diversity, um, at, grounded in equity, grounded in social justice, grounded in dialogicness and listening. Um, and we wanted to be as bold and as quick and as adventurous in enacting this new plan as we could in order to become a dynamic new model for um, other museums across the country. So it was a highly aspirational set of notions. And um, the writing of this mission and vision statement was interesting because we were already doing a lot of that work. We were simply cementing it as language. And I think committing ourselves um, over and over again in the rereading, um, in the recitation of that language to keep doing the good work. So what I'm going to step you through um, how we achieve this kind of change and perhaps be a little self-critical and self-reflective in doing that because I, I, I do believe that our focus has necessarily shifted in the last three to six months. And the museum is not, I wouldn't say is going in a different direction. It's, it's broadening its conception of um, a social justice mission beyond the galleries. So next slide, please. Um, we have, as an institution, um, developed a reputation for championing, championing the work of um, uh, artists of color, particularly black Americans working in the post-war period. And uh, we have in a short period, in a short stretch of time, mounted more exhibitions with a focus on this particular area um, than any other uh, institution across the country. Next slide, please. I'm just gonna show you a couple of images and the next one, um, and maybe the next two. So, as I said, my, my conviction is that black American artists constitute this golden generation. And so when we speak about the diversification of our creative program, I believe it's an investment in two uh, equal principles held in balance. So one is um, equity as an idea, as an ideology that grounds the work that we do, and excellence because the, the collecting and exhibition of excellent works of art has always been in the DNA of the BMA. Um, so I, I always refer back to the defining moment in the institution's history when the Cone Sisters of Baltimore made the historic decision to give the Cone Collection to the museum in 1949. So with that historic gesture, we went from being a merely great museum to a world-class destination in a nanosecond. So um, having a history like that is both a benefit and a burden. I think you have to charge yourself with thinking as boldly um, as those sisters did and as the museum did in accepting the gift and think about how you um, can capture the greatness of your moment, the spirit of your moment to fundamentally shift the DNA of a big civic institution um, and make it better than it was when you found it. So um, we believe that the, what we're doing with this, with this generation of black Americans is precisely that. It's also an invitation to look backwards um, at histories that have been um, neglected by the canon as it's always been recited in classrooms. So I think this is fascinating, particularly speaking in the context of um, uh, in a higher education context. The histories that we are telling um, as part of our exhibition program and, exhibit and our acquisition strategy are not histories that I was taught in the classroom. 
So um, we are telling new histories for a new public. The textbooks I studied from, the way I learned art history um, was one story. And through research and truth telling, we are unearthing and showing to a very eager community uh, entirely another. And so I, I had a very epiphanic moment probably 14 years ago, I walked, walked into the studio of the artist who's what you see on the screen, Mark Bradford. And um, he, Mark is now, he's one of my best friends. He's um, almost certainly the, our greatest living painter. He's reinvented the terms of abstraction again and again and again. Um, but as an extremely young curator, uh, I walked into a studio in Los Angeles and at that point, Mark wasn't particularly well known. And uh, he had a very tiny studio in South Central Los Angeles. He opened the door and I looked right past this towering, you know, majestic figure and saw these extraordinary paintings, um, silver that stretched from the ceiling to the floor made entirely of paper. And it was a moment when I thought, I, everything I'd been taught in the classroom was wrong. And there was a whole other history that I could explore. And it, the concept, the sort of the realization which didn't have language at that point, sort of set my head on fire and caused me to think um, I could have a career in this field. So then fast forward about 14 years and Mark is representing the United States in Venice at the Venice Biennale. Um, I had the honor of being the commissioner and the co-curator along with my colleague, Katie Siegel. And then we brought the exhibition to Baltimore free of charge. And uh, we were able to offer it to, you know, hundreds of thousands of people who obviously didn't have the resources or the awareness to get to Venice to see the Olympics of the art world. So um, I tell that story because I think it connects the micro and the macro in a really profound way. And it was really Mark that set me on my course and his work that caused me to want to revise art history. And through him, um, I've been able to look backwards and look forwards. So Mark didn't sort of materialize out of thin air. He does have an enormous line of predecessors going back to people like Norman Lewis and Alma Thomas working in relative obscurity in the middle years of the 20th century. So to show Mark Bradford, you must show his predecessors. And also to show, and to show and collect Mark Bradford, you must show his successes. So we, we feel a sort of obligation to tell the totality of that story. So next slide, please. Um, and the next one. Uh, we, and I, one thing that I find particularly compelling about encyclopedic institutions is uh, their intrinsic diversity. So that impulse to keep showing um, the work of artists of color is, is, is something that prevails across collecting areas. So um, not just contemporary, but the American Wing too. And this is a, a, an exhibition by Ebony Patterson that did live very spectacularly, as you can tell, in our American Wing. Um, I think that the, the principles of equity and diversity can live in every aspect of a museum's functioning. I'll get into that a little bit more later. But um, we began doing this work with an emphasis on the post-war period and increasingly have tried to diversify that address to cover other collecting areas across the institution, uncover new histories, so that eventually when um, our work is done at the institution, the, those stories are far more varied and rich than they were when we found them. Next slide. Um, I, th this, this is a variously important image for me um, for a variety of reasons. And I'm, I elected to move to Baltimore and to direct the Baltimore Museum of Art for all the reasons I articulated to you at the beginning of this talk. What I did not realize is that with the, the city is home to one of the most extraordinary creative classes in the world. And again, a creative class anchored in black creativity specifically. And I did not, I didn't know the depth and breadth of that world when I arrived in the city, but it came, became increasingly and quickly apparent to me that we could run a world-class program in part based on the work of artists living and working in Baltimore, which sounds sort of mundane as an observation, but that is not a claim that I could make about any other city in this country other than possibly New York and Los Angeles. And even if I were to make that claim, the reason for the richness of those two contexts has to do with the economics of the art world and the, and the influx of people from elsewhere to that place. 
Baltimore's particular creative expression is extremely homegrown and is very, very rooted in questions of race and social justice. So incredibly aligned with the direction we want to take the museum. So an adage we use again and again is wholly local and wholly global. So Mark Bradford is, an, is a terrific example of um, an artist who has an enormous global reputation who we brought to Baltimore. So as a way of serving our audience. Now, Mark also has an incredibly local beginning. He went to art school very late in life in his late thirties, um, was a hairdresser up until the middle, his middle thirties, um, and is now the most successful abstract painter living and working today. So as we sort of scour Baltimore for those, for those artists that we want to make part of our program, one of the abiding commitments is that the next Mark Bradford does live in Baltimore. I mean, I believe that wholeheartedly. There is zero question that that kind of talent exists in the city. The question for us is how are we going to, how are we going to use the mechanism of the museum to find and show those people and thus telegraph them to the world? So wholly local and wholly global. And I think one great service we can do is ensuring that the, the world recognizes um, that Baltimore is home to this amazing creative class. And that's been an exciting and somewhat unexpected dimension of my time at the BMA. And next slide, please. Um, I'm going to try and speed up so I can talk about the totality of my presentation, but every slide is sort of an invitation to chat. Um, I did want to draw attention to this exhibition, Everyday Selections from the Collection, because it was such a culminating moment for us. Um, we, our, our contemporary wing hadn't been substantively reconceived since it was dedicated. So this is decades and decades and decades. And like many institutions, um, it told a very predictable, by the book, canonical white story. Um, those the, sort of the middle years of the 20th century up to the present were told through a series of movements, um, abstract expressionism, color field, minimalism, post-minimalism, conceptualism. And we had simply exam good, great examples of those periods as do all good collecting institutions across the country. So we could have been any one of say, you know, 20, world-class demi-encyclopedic or encyclopedic museums around the country. So the question we pose to ourselves is how do we align a collection presentation with the expectations and demographics of the city and the work that we're doing in, in collection development? So um, we, we revised our permanent collection presentation um, in the West Wing according to a very simple principle. So if the majority of permanent collection presentations have a roughly sort of 80 to 90 percent um, uh, contingent of white artists grounding them and around the periphery, um, you know, roughly 10 percent artists of color. What would the story look like? What new and different stories would be, we be able to tell if we simply inverted that principle? So we did precisely that with selections from the collection and it foregrounded many objects that hadn't been shown um, at the museum for decades and decades alongside um, works that we acquired in anticipation of this moment. So it was a very proud culminating statement. And next slide, please. Um, this was the largest assembly of black abstraction um, uh, ever installed in a museum setting. It was a pretty comprehensive narrative of um, post-war painting and sculpture by black Americans um, spanning the years roughly 1940 all the way to the present and which is magisterial exhibition um, that we were very, very proud of and we were able to extend partially free to our public, which is hugely important. And next slide. Mel Edwards Crossroads. I just want to mention Mel because um, in my opinion, he's this, he's this country's greatest living artist working in three dimensions, greatest living sculpture. And it happens that by dint of uh, marriage, he is now a uh, Baltimore resident. So we can now claim America's greatest sculpture as our very own, which I think is a, uh, we are going to try and make abundantly apparent in the years upcoming. And next slide. Um, so the BMA does, does absolutely nothing in half measures. And um, that's something I'm extraordinarily proud of. So when we were, when we were looking at um, initiatives for the coming years, it was brought up in an executive committee session of the board um, that 2020 is the centennial of women's suffrage. And it so happened that we already had in place a number of major exhibitions of female identifying artists happening this year. Um, 
and into 2021. So we decided um, that we would in fact commit every exhibition, every public program, and ultimately every acquisition to female identifying artists. And there were two, it was sort of three anchor reasons for that. One was the centennial. The second was an analysis of the collection that yielded a very shocking statistic, um, which is that only 4% of our roughly 99,000 objects are works by female identifying artists. So 4% uh, of that number cannot possibly be based on merit. That has to be emblematic of longstanding bias and prejudice. And so we felt a need to both own that deficit in our own collecting practices and begin the long and arduous process of remedying those, those various gaps. Um, and then, then in terms of exhibition making, again, to be very self-critical, we look back at the history of the institution and realized that we had never done a major ticketed monographic exhibition focused on the woman artist in our history. So the Joan Mitchell retrospective, which was originally scheduled to open in the fall of 2020, which is now rescheduled for obvious reasons to the spring of 21, will be the first major monograph at the BMA with an accompanying catalog in our changing exhibition galleries, which I find it's, it, you know, it's a combination of really electrifying to have achieved it and really shameful to have to admit that that's the case. And next slide. Um, this, this is uh, an installation by the great American artist, McLean Thomas, that was a consequence of a major endowment gift from Robert E. Meyerhoff and Rita Becker, as you can see. Um, we, we asked them to create a fund that would allow us to recreate every two years our lobby. Um, uh, sort of changing the face of the institution, making it more relevant and accessible to our audiences. And as you can, if you're familiar with the BMA, and if you're looking at these images, you know how totalizing Michelin's treatment of our lobby is here. So absolutely remarkable. Um, and we will be actually be extending um, this exhibition by about six, or this installation by about six months to account for our period of closure, which is exciting. And next slide. Katarina Grosser, another fabulous um, female identifying painter from Germany who made an absolutely monstrous and extraordinary installation in our West Wing, um, which like everything else will be substantially extended so that our viewers can enjoy it. And next slide. You can just keep rolling through these, Courtney. Um, just an example of Joan Mitchell's painting. So then, um, it's a nice transition from talking about exhibitions to talking about acquisitions because um, I think what has differentiated the BMA's approach to a change-based agenda is our adoption of a systemic strategy. So um, the most institutions um, that hang their hats on questions of diversity or, or um, are very sort of partial and non-systemic in their treatment of that question or in their acknowledgement of, as that, of that as a deficit in their histories. And um, with the adoption of our strategic plan and with our mission and vision statements, there was a broad recognition on the board and on the staff that if we are truly to change our molecular structure at the institution, it has to happen across every area of activity. So exhibitions, sure, but exhibitions come and go. Um, but we also needed a war chest of money to do many, many other things, which I'll get to, one being to change the permanent collection. So we went through a historic deaccessioning, um, which has become a real bellwether in the field. Um, in 2018, uh, we dispensed with seven paintings. You can just keep running the slides, Courtney, thanks. Um, seven paintings by some very canonical white artists, um, all male. <laughs> and. Uh, uh, created a fund, or war chest as I put it, of about um, $18 million uh, to diversify our collection with a focus on the work of men and women of color in the post-war period. Um, so this was an extraordinary news story that sort of jumped the fence into the mainstream as some of our initiatives have because they press so hard on social conditions. And, um, you know, it was 90% positively received. Those um, news outlets that took issue with our action did it, that, or, uh, took issue because they felt that um, we were dispensing with great masterpieces, specifically by white male artists, in order to buy the work of a sort of an untested class of artists of color. Um, so I take great issue with the untested um, acclaim, but 
And I, you know, I think that the investments we've made, which I'm about to show you, will demonstrate just how extraordinary the collection is becoming um, and how relevant as a consequence of this investment. But I will also say that this, that the, the, the act of selling work by white male artists to diversify the collection wasn't exactly deliberate. What it, what it does for me most profoundly is point to the basic bias that has structured institutional collecting for um, quite literally centuries. So if, if when we deaccession to buy, we are looking for poor quality, storage burden, redundancy, high value in combination with redundancies, these are some of the, the qualities we look for in identifying works for sale. Um, of course, redundancy is going to exist in the category that's always been privileged. So it makes, it should be no surprise to anyone that we are incredibly rich in mid-century work by white male painters because that is all that was ever collected. So um, when the claim is made that we are sort of polemically um, victimizing white men to achieve this change, I say that's absolutely untrue. Um, our collection has been structured by bias, therefore the redundancy in excess is in that area. We're simply working with the history that we inherited to try and make um, a different, richer, better and truer one. So I'll show you just very quickly, run you through some acquisitions we were able to make. Um, Isaac Julian's iconic three channel video, uh, Baltimore, made in this city. Uh, Wengechi Mutu's Water Woman, which has very quickly become um, our most iconic work. Amy Sherald's first double portrait, Amy Sherald is um, trained in Baltimore, lived in Baltimore for many years, is sort of our, our great most famous um, painter. Uh, made most famous by the fact that she is the person responsible for Michelle Obama's extraordinary portrait. Um, Jack Whitten's 9-11, I could talk about this for two hours, so I'm going to resist it. Um, he, he, is, this is, he is one of the great artists of the 20th into 21st century, and this is his great masterpiece painting, and we are extraordinarily fortunate to have it. And the Jekyll Crosby, one of the young living stars working today. Um, Mary Lovelace O'Neill. We we also so one of the one of the traits that museums um, have that gives us a great advantage often over private collectors in identifying works for to acquire is the scholarly research bent of our curatorial teams, and so uncovering those histories that commerce has ignored is something that we can do much more easily than others. So Mary Lovelace O'Neill is an artist who um, had toiled in complete and utter obscurity for decades upon decades. Um, born in 1942, we found this painting being offered at auction. One of our more astute curators said, you know, this is incredibly aligned with the work that we're trying to do. Um, and we should absolutely go after this painting. Um, so we did at Swan, Swan Auction House. Uh, we were the only bidder and we bought the painting for $37,000, which in the scheme of the art world is sort of um, cents on the dollar. So if we keep going with the slides, um, I think unfortunately we don't have an image of it. Okay, so we were able to, um, so then fast forward to the present. We showed that painting, if you go back to Mary Lovelace O'Neill, in the context of a permanent collection installation and a number of dealers from New York came to see what we've been doing. Um, one of them identified Mary Lovelace as being particularly interesting, tracked the artist down, um, made a connection to her, offered her um, a solo exhibition in New York. That exhibition happened in very short order. We were one of the institutions that bought an additional painting from that show. Um, and they were selling for between $500,000 and a million dollars per campus immediately. So um, I say that because I think there was an impetus for me to talk about systemic change and how to make a decision that then has a big ripple effect beyond the, the art world itself. Um, and that is a really terrific example. Uh, so public programs, th this like exhibition making was something that we were able to do um, incredibly quickly. It's a very sort of native discipline to museums. Um, so we established a fund with the generosity of Suzanne F. Cohen, um, a former chair of the board, uh, very, very sadly now deceased. She made an amazing gift in support of the new vision for the institution that was intended to bring some of the most prominent black intellectuals from across the country to Baltimore. And as you can see, 
Manny Kane, Nicole Hannah Jones, Tanahisi Coates, um, Mark Bradford, McLean Thomas, the list goes on and on and on. So we're able to do that that relatively um, quickly in sort of the, the lifespan of the institution. Um, next slide, please. Uh, and these are just some, some images of our uh, engagement with our broader and more diverse communities that define uh, the work we're doing in Baltimore. Uh, so just to move quickly to into the COVID-19 period, sorry, Courtney, if you go back one slide. Um, you know, one, one phrase I use often in conversation with our particular senior leadership team is that if we as an institution want to achieve um, relevance relative to the mainstream, we have to have as a, a museum, a metabolism that is as quick as the mainstream, which means that we have to be more um, responsive to the rhythms of the social world and less adherent to the disciplines and timelines that have defined the work that we do within museums. So um, when we were looking at how to be responsive to the COVID-19 period, we obviously knew that we couldn't host these enormous convenings that we'd been doing by bringing ta Coates Coates and Mark Bradford and McLean Thomas to our auditorium, inviting 400 people to sit cheek by jowl and enjoy these extraordinary events. But we wanted to keep providing a service that felt relevant to our constituents. So we reconceived that fund and deployed it in three specific ways. Um, I'm sorry, my dogs have entered the room, so I'm going to get rid of them quickly and then resume. One second. Come on, one second. The perils of zooming from home. I apologize for that. Um, so we wanted to, to make sure that we stayed as relevant and as present as possible work for our audiences. And so we reconceived that fund to um, support artists one, in one way through this initiative called The Screening Room, uh, where we invited Baltimore-based video artists to show their work using a platform that we, we created. And we paid them um, in or for their work, which was a way to you know, extend support during a period of time when they were deeply challenged um, by the economic circumstances precipitated by COVID-19. So extraordinary and a credit to our senior leadership team that they can move so quickly um, in reconceiving a program in response to a stimulus. And I just want to emphasize how unusual that is for an institution to have that capacity. Uh, next slide. Um, and the next one. So in, in addition to, to all of that, um, we are in the process now of uh, building and should be able to dedicate in the fall of 2021 two new centers at the museum. One, a center for the study of prints, drawings, and photographs. And if you just keep advancing the slides, Courtney. Um, and then the other, a um, center for the study of Matisse. So if we can just stay on this one for a second. Um, I think it's really, really important, again, in thinking about systems of change to think about filling the pipeline um, into museum leadership with difference. So the way we describe systems at the museum is um, exhibitions, obviously, that we've talked about, acquisitions we've talked about, public programs, staff, um, board, and even vendor decisions that we make. So a sort of a, a total social fabric within the bounds of the institution that models the world that we imagine. So we've done great work in diversifying our board. Um, we've done considerable work in diversifying our staff. I feel very strongly that if we're going to make Black American artists as the leading edge of our creative program, we need to have creative interpreters that share um, uh, background and experiences with those artists. So there's sort of a symmetry between the producer and the interpreter. Um, I also think that we have, we can play an extraordinary classroom function in Baltimore. And by creating these two centers, the Center for the Study of Prince Drawings and Photographs and the Matisse Center, we're trying to position ourselves to be um, a leader in diversifying the pipeline into creative work in museums and then ultimately museum leadership. So um, Prince Drawings and Photographs is an incredibly conventional area of study. Um, within museums, we happen to have one of the strongest collections in the in the world. Um, we've never committed a space to it um, in our history. We've certainly never committed a publicly accessible study room like this one um, to the collection. 
the collection is able to tell a comprehensive, uninterrupted history of Western art from the late 15th century all the way to the present. So it's an unparalleled teaching tool. And we are going to make it available free of charge by appointment to absolutely anybody in Baltimore who wants to study uh, works on paper directly. So be that um, a middle school student, an elementary school student, a city school student, a private school student, um, a, a scholar of extraordinary renown, or simply a curious member of the public. So this will be a public space by appointment juxtaposed with storage, a storage facility, which allows us to easily bring those objects into the room for study and an exhibition space. So it's a sort of a way to collapse the mechanism of a museum, which is usually behind the scenes, into um, a smaller form in a public setting, sort of incentivizing people to use the riches um, that we usually keep behind closed doors and think about ways that they too could participate in telling this new and diverse history of art. Um, next slide. I'm just showing you here a couple of, you know, dazzling renderings of the, the um, inside of the Matisse sensor, so just to give you a sense of the, sort of the environment in which we'll be inviting people to have these experiences too. And next slide. Okay, well, it seems like that's the end. So um, I think what I'm trying to, what I'm trying to capture here is um, an idea of directing a museum that goes beyond um, simply an exhibition here, an exhibition there, an acquisition here, an acquisition there. Um, I think if, if the, this period of time has taught us anything, it's that we, we are in, as a, as a culture, in the grip of um, great calamity. And we, we, we are fortunate to have among our ranks um, Janetta Cole, who is probably known to you all. She's one of the great cultural leaders in this country. Um, a sort of living civil rights icon. And I had her um, talk to both our board and her, our staff recently. And she made the point that we're in the grip of a um, dual pandemic. So one is new and health related. And that health related pandemic has thrown into high relief um, a second and uh, equally deadly one, namely systemic racism. And it's various different manifestations across the um, country and those problems are deep seated within institutions. So we have spent a long time thinking about how we can positively participate in creating a culture within our institution, an equitable culture within our institution, and an and an un, a museum that's unparalleled in its accessibility to a diverse public. So um, outward expression certainly which is very native to museums, but also the creation of sort of a model universe within our walls that answers the call of those artists who for years and years and years have been saying, we need equity, we need justice, we need truth. So um, this period of time for me has been less about, um, you know, advancing a conventional creative program or sort of complicating um, an existing and laudable creative program, and more thinking about systems of change, transitioning from creative program to policy adjustment in order to affect um, change at the institution that will be systemic and sustainable. So that's sort of the next three years of work at the BMA, and that's the you know the driving the big existential driving force behind the work that we do. So um, I think that. That does it for me. Um, so we can just dive into any questions that anybody might have, but thank you so much for um, enduring a long monologue. Chris, this is Susan. Thank you. Um, really fascinating and really extraordinary what you're doing and what your team is doing at the BMA. We do have a number of questions, so right. I, I want to jump in and we'll see how far we get. Yep. Um, I think um, one of the statements, comments that someone made um, that I think is worth um, mentioning is that um, when you were talking about the spectacular work of, of um, Mary O'Neill, that there really needs to be no rationale for why we would be, you know, diversifying of white artists and bringing in the kind of work that you're bringing in. Right. And that, that, that just speaks to how institutional racism has been um, permeating many of the institutions um, and, and, and continues to, right? So, um, and what a great title of that painting, really spectacular. Yeah, I mean, an extraordinary woman, an extraordinary artist. Um, and, you know, 
when, when I began focusing on people like Mary Lovelace O'Neill, let's say a decade ago, um, the sort of sheer extent of um, institutionalized racism and the way that it permeated the art world and particularly the market created a sort of economic opportunity that was a consequence of bias. So if you fast forward to the present, certainly some of that bias has been mitigated by a rising awareness that there is a whole other history that has been untold that itself is an opportunity in, in market terms. So you do see a tremendous um, adjustment in the upward direction um, in values associated particularly with Black American painters and sculptors. But, you know, unless institutions actively participate in um, championing those people who have been written out of those histories and bringing them to, into the light, there will be no economic advantage to, the, to those extraordinary creative people within their lifetimes. I think ultimately, you know, in, in a sort of hundreds and hundreds of years span, time will eventually unearth everybody who participated in um, you know, the, the formal and social trajectory of art history. Um, but I would like to think that those people who did play such a meaningful role could actually enjoy the fruit of it while they're still alive. And so for a long time, that's not been happening. Um, Mary is obviously now, now very advanced um, in years. And I think it's fabulous that she's achieving recognition, but it is far too late. Mm. It, it, well, well, point well taken. Um, we have a, a, a question about the spectacular black abstract art exhibition that you shared just a few images of. And yeah. um, I think folks were curious about why that did not tour around the country. Um, it was such a statement. Um, mm -hmm. Are you planning on taking some of the exhibitions out to other museums? So we do have an extremely active touring program of our exhibitions. It's funny, that, that show in fact did travel to about seven other institutions. We called it by a different name in Baltimore. So um, Generations was intended to make the subject matter more direct and accessible. It traveled under the moniker Solidary and Solitary, um, which it, you know, is a title sort of too complicated to explain. Beautiful, poetic, but complicated, a little bit opaque. Um, and while the show, I think, was incredibly persuasive and arresting as a physical experience, we did find from other institutions that the public didn't readily understand the content through the title. And mm -hmm. so we've been disinclined to have the experience. So we, we very deliberately changed the way we were describing it to telegraph the content more directly to Baltimore. Well, and that's an interesting point in terms of um, how something is framed and how something is delivered, right, yeah. within communities. And it seems like you are really working to um, educate and, um, and bring uh, this whole concept around um, Black painters, but also the culture, the creative class that you talked about early in your, in your talk, and really lift that up so that we are really discovering um, what is a value here and and what we what we really looked beyond. Um, yeah, I mean, I think directness of communication is really, really important. I'm not so interested in talking to the already converted members of the art world. I'm interested in diverse people and diverse voices from all sorts of different backgrounds entering the museum because they feel the work we're doing has relevance to their lives. So that means speaking in a deliberately sort of non-disciplinary language. Um, a, a deliberately accessible language. So what is this show actually about? Just stating that very clearly in our press materials so that we, we capture the broadest um, interest from our public. Well, and you, you mentioned classrooms and also working across a range of age groups. And, um, and also, as I understand, I know that you've done quite a bit of work in the community. Do you want to talk a little bit about some of the work you've done at Lexington Market? Yeah, so um, we had, T. Rowe Price were very generous in providing us with a grant, I think about four years ago, for something called the BMA Outpost, um, which was a way for us to take uh, everything that we do in the BMA around art and education and make it mobile um, and have those initiatives live in pockets of the city for periods of time, maybe sort of a couple of months before moving on. And it was a you know, fascinating enterprise, highly successful, great at network building, 
Um, but one, I think, predictable outcome from that enterprise was the idea was was the the feedback we received from particularly invested communities that said, well, you know, that was really great for two months, but we in fact don't want you to leave. Right. So what is going to be the art museum presence within our context going forward? And we were not able to positively answer that for every community that we engage with, unfortunately. But we did have the resources to do that permanently um, in one place. And so we sort of cast around for the best location. And I think we felt that a combination of the, the very active and enthusiastic partnership we received from the Lexington market, the absolutely extraordinary diversity across economics and race that constitutes the, um, the visitors to that market made the Lexington market our sort of our natural partner. And so we committed to a permanent space um, there, which is focused on art, education, um, you know, Frank, just listening, healing, um, uh, meeting social need. And it's been among the most successful things we've been able to achieve at the museum, um, bar none. The numbers are amazing. The anecdotal feedback is like nothing I've ever read in a museum context. And so um, we are again in the newly reimagined, revamped Lexington market going to stake our claim as a permanent resident alongside those vendors because we think um, it's more important to go to people than to ask them to come to us. And then eventually, once you've gained trust and familiarity in that kind of a context, then maybe there will be some natural cross-pollination between the work we do at the museum, the mothership, um, and our satellite locations like Lexington Market. Mm -hmm. We're getting a lot of questions and I, I know we're gonna run out of time, so I'm gonna kind of run through a couple here. Um, how does the Baltimore Museum of Art see its role um, relative to other museums in the city? And is there, coordinate, is there a coordinated effort to promote underrepresented artists? So um, we, we try to partner with as many institutions as possible on as many initiatives as possible. I think that we've found that those partnerships happen quickly and most naturally with non-visual art-based organizations. And Gami and Gio, who, live, who leads all of our engagement activities, who's a member of our senior staff, speaks very eloquently about this. And she's the person responsible for brokering all of those relationships. Um, you know, what I would say is that uh, you know, our great peer institution, the Walters, is much more traditional um, in its focus and a little more disassociated from sort of the art and the politics of the present and has a metabolism, as I said, that's more um, traditional within the museum field. So very long gestation periods for exhibitions, very long gestation periods for acquisitions. So we, we have found, because we have this kind of ethic of responsiveness, greater luck in working with, let's say, churches. So Union Baptist Church has become a very frequent collaborator of ours, um, not only on public programs, but increasingly on public art commissions. And I find that exploring those avenues and accessing those communities just, uh, you know, electrifying. It's so interesting and different for, um, as a museum priority. So um, how can um, folks, um support the museum, um, not necessarily in a financial way, but what are some of the things that folks on this call can do? How can they get involved? Well, I mean, we have, um, obviously, <laughs> I would be remiss as the director of the museum if I were not to say that we, uh, particularly during this period of time, are in dire need of financial support to make sure that we take care of the institution, the art, and those people within um, our structure that run it. Um, in terms of supporting the institution, what I personally want to see is as many people as humanly possible from as many different backgrounds within us within our space because I think the more people that have the experience we extend to our visitors, the more um, emphatic the positive impact we can have on culture is. I mean, I think that we are, I always refer to the BMA as the biggest classroom in Baltimore. I think we view it as our obligation to use our exhibitions and our installations to teach the principles that are the value-based um, foundation of the museum. So um, simply coming, um, experiencing, telegraphing that experience and helping us radically build that public, um, both in scale and in diversity is the most important thing for me. One of um, our colleagues writes, and I think I mentioned this earlier, that we can think about the museum as a metaphor for other institutions. And so I'd love for you to talk a little bit more about how you have thought about 
the systemic problems that of racism and um, uh, implicit bias and other um, issues that I know you've wrestled with there. Mm -hmm. um, how have you thought about you know bringing on more um, diverse management, thinking about docents, for example? Mm -hmm. um, how did you really thought about threading the institution with more diversity? Um, can, because I think it's very equivalent to um, thinking about more um, black faculty, more black and, and brown students at a university setting. Like, what are the approaches? I know the philosophy you mentioned, but how do you how do you go about doing that and sustaining that? Well, so I mean, there's so many different methodologies that we use. I mean, one one I would say is that there is a broad commitment to the idea that the more diverse people you have in the room, the better the product that you output is. So I think if you have all like-minded people in the room working on one problem, you're unlikely to come up with the most interesting and creative solution. So to me, um, the greater diversity you have on the, your staff, also the better the work that you do is. So I always like to point to the excellence that is a consequence of the investment in equity, because I think that that's absolutely true. Um, getting there can sometimes be a little trickier because, um, of course, we in cultural institutions, like all other um, hiring entities have to abide by labor laws. So there are certain things you can't do. So for instance, if we have a curatorial opening, we can't simply say, I am going to hire, um, or I will only interview or hire a person of color for that position. What you can do um, is say to your managers, I want to see 75% of the candidates for that position being people of color, which sort of radically tilts the possibility of that being an outcome in your favor if that's your vision. So that's you know, one way just mechanically to, um, to mandate a diversification of the candidate pool that you're dealing with. Um, I would also say that, uh, you know, we, people who have achieved success in the museum field have largely achieved it as a consequence of belief from others and advocacy from others. And so um, formal and informal mentorship structures within museum settings, I think are enormously important to ensure the ascendance um, of diverse candidates uh, through, through the pipeline into eventually um, museum leadership. So I will say to our board of trustees, um, the, the ultimate success of the work I do at the museum will be that my successor doesn't look like me. Um, so I don't think that I'm the change itself. I think that I'm the agent of getting there. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's really important that other uh, white directors with a similar agenda think of themselves that way. You're, you actually are not the end result. There is a result that goes beyond you and you have to participate in filling the pipeline with enough diversity that eventually you're replaced by somebody who is the true fulfillment of your vision. That's a, you know, that's a, <laughs> a you know, a difficult thing, I, I think, for a lot of people to wrap their heads around. And even saying it out loud is, is um, you know, it's a new way of thinking about systemic change. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What are the other museums around the country and around the world um, saying? Are they, are you seeing change within those institutions um, based on the notes that you've been hitting that are so loud? Well, I think that we have been agitating for this change very aggressively for a long time. I think that our message has been substantially amplified by the uptick in uh, activism among employees and artists that's been directed at institutions demanding um, radical changes in the way that they staff, in the way that they acquire, in the way that they present and represent. So um, the, the rise of the Black Lives Matter movement and the way that that awareness has swept the country has had um, a really positive effect in drawing attention to some of the work that we've been doing um, so that, that concept or that aspiration that we would become a replicable model has been sort of forced into reality because institutions are being made to reckon with what they haven't done for so long um, by the Black Lives Matter movement. So it's a you know, really, really fascinating period of time. And a lot of it is tethered to privilege and economics because the curatorial field you know, in particular is one highly structured um, by privilege. If you go way back to the origins of the discipline, um, caretakers of art in England were radically underpaid or, or unpaid completely because they came from um, the landed gentry and didn't need money. They had more than enough money. It was sort of a dalliance. It was, a, it was something that added 
luster to their social reputation. They didn't need to be compensated because they came from such privilege anyway. And I think that unfortunately the inheritance of that origin takes us all the way into the present. And it's one of the reasons that you see such a homogenous white leadership set in museums because it takes so long to train for the position. It's so expensive to train for the position. The chances of success are so de minimis. And even if you are successful, you're underpaid. So why in the world, as a member of a vulnerable class, would you decide to leap into that discipline? This doesn't make any logical sense. So we have to develop economic means of incentivizing diversity as well. That is, I can't even begin to emphasize how important that is. Yeah, you mentioned the pipeline and um, one of our, our viewers uh, made, the, made the point that, um, you know, if you were taking advantage of layoffs and furloughs and, and changing your staffing patterns, that would be one way to do it. But that, you know, this idea of seniority where, you know, white folks have been given 200 years a head start on seniority so right and, and right. obviously the privilege that we have a question and i know this is going to be a difficult one to do in just a couple minutes but very early on someone mentioned that they've been talking about these issues in their church series yeah. and that um there's so much fuzzy language around things like racism implicit bias xenophobia right. um white privilege um how do you get a bead on these term, this terminology? And is it really like layers of an, of an onion? Um, I know you do a lot of staff training. Mm -hmm. um, do you want to talk a little bit about um, beyond conflict also? Because I think that's an interesting paradigm. Yeah, I mean, certainly. What, what I would say is that um, I think you put it incredibly nicely. If white people in this country have a 200 year lead start, head start, you can't achieve equity in the present by being quote unquote fair that is not that that won't work and so um it is it's my strong belief that in order to compensate for that very very long period of time we have to radically distort in acknowledgement of those sins to produce a new future much more quickly so that to me involves learning um and understanding history so that those terms like implicit bias or systemic racism, that, you, that they cease to become terms and words and they begin to signify actual moments in history. So what does systemic racism mean? Well, in order to properly understand that, you have to go back to the origins of the slave trade, like sort of how that happened. So if you listen to somebody like Darren Walker, who leads the Ford Foundation, um, and if somebody asks him, well, could you explain to me why um, a board of trustees is so often white dominated, he'll say, so I'm gonna, I will step you through the logic um, that explains the economics of that condition, beginning with the slave trade. And um, I can't give you an immediate solution, but if you acknowledge the, um, the period of violent bias that structured those years, you will at least begin to understand the dire necessity to address them quickly right now. So we, we do a lot of, we do a lot of training um, at the museum around this and in the coming two or three years, we'll be doing much more because as I said, we're trying to move away from a focus on creative program and much more to culture creation and policy creation. And that means making sure that everybody in the, in, in the institution is as versed in these things, as comfortable and as conversant in them as they can be. And I would be remiss in saying that we know a lot more about implicit bias as yeah. a as a neuroscience function and with yeah. neuroscientists on the phone, I think it's worth saying that we're understanding more about how the brain and body yeah. work in these areas. Yeah. We are out of time, Chris, and I think okay. there are more questions. We could go on for much longer, but we really appreciate your tremendous insights and the work that you're doing at the museum. And we're looking forward to continuing to build partnerships with you. So thank you so much for your time today. And um, Victoria- It was a pleasure. And I hope that every one of the, uh, the remaining 99 participants has come to the museum when we are reopen on September 16th. Yay, we'll be there. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you wonderful. very, very much. Thank you so much. And Victoria, yeah. I'm gonna go ahead and turn it back over to you. Perfect. Thank you so much. And, um, and thank you, Chris, for joining us today and sharing your knowledge and expertise with us. Uh, thank you, Susan, for moderating beautifully. And also thank you, Courtney, for your support and for advancing slides. 
I'd like to invite everyone to join us next Thursday, August 25th at 3.30, when we'll view a portion of the documentary 13th, followed by an interactive discussion. Thanks again, everyone. We will see you soon.